Uh, as you've heard also throughout our uh, morning, uh, we're in a series entitled The Gospel in Seven Words. And uh, if you've not been with us the last few weeks, what that means is we've been looking at key passages of Scripture and trying to distill them down into just seven words because uh, Scripture tells us we should be ready to give an answer when anyone asks us for the hope that is within us. So a few weeks ago, for example, Pastor Randy, our teaching pastor, looked at 2 Corinthians 5, where we heard that God in Christ reconciled us back. He dealt with the brokenness inside of us, this thing we call a sin condition. Uh, He redeemed and restored us and then brought us back into a relationship with him. And so God in Christ reconciled us back. And then a couple weeks ago, Pastor Tom shared with us how Jesus frees us from all our prisons. Maybe you felt like you're trapped in some area of your life. Maybe there's some shame that you carried with you even into the room today. And the great news is that Jesus has come to set us free from anything that would hold us back or separate us from, from him. He separates or he frees us from all our prisons. Uh, and then last weekend, Pastor Randy looked at one of my favorite chapters in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Uh, the story of Jesus and one of his dearest friends, Lazarus, who had gotten very, very sick and died. And Jesus came and actually brought him back to life. But before he did, he declared, I am the resurrection and the life. Maybe you know these words, John chapter 11, 25 and 26. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. And even if he were to die, even so shall he live. Right. And so what we are preparing to celebrate during Holy Week and Easter is summarized in these seven words. Though we die, Jesus gives resurrection life. And we have this hope and this promise that his resurrection from the dead, what we celebrate on Easter, is also a present reality we can access and enjoy today. Um, This weekend, uh, we're going to shift our focus to what you heard Sarah describe, uh, the opposites of isolation and community and how the good news of what God has done for us in Christ speaks to that as well. So here's the seven words I want us to focus on today. Why don't you read these out loud with me? Jesus refuses to leave his people alone. Loneliness is a challenge for almost every one of us, feeling isolated, separated, without community, feeling alone. Uh, A number of studies have come out looking into the impact of loneliness on us emotionally as well as physically. Here's one from a few years ago, May 2018. It was reported in the USA Today. Uh, Loneliness actually has the same effect on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which makes it even more dangerous than obesity. Um, It literally can kill us. Or, fast forward a couple years later, this was in what I like to call deep, dark COVID. Do you remember that first summer, right, where we were trying to navigate all of that strange world? This is July 2020 uh, from the Scientific American, Why Young Americans Are Lonely and What We Can Do About It. It says, loneliness, much like hunger or thirst, is a signal that we are lacking something and can even contribute to heart disease, stroke, or premature death. You know, it's interesting, if you go back in your Bibles to almost the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2 describes how God created human beings, and the first that he created was Adam. He formed him out of the dust of the earth. He breathed his life into him. He became a living being, and this was all before there was a problem with sin, okay? But God observed Adam on his own, even though he was surrounded by everything good that God had made, he was incomplete. Genesis 2.18, it is not good for the man to be alone, God said. And so he made for Adam a helper, a companion, his wife, Eve, creating the first family and the first community. And what's true then is still true now. We are not designed to go through life alone. And when we do, we often suffer as a result. How many of you uh, have Legos at home? Any Legos people here? Okay. All right. Some of you have kids, grandkids with Legos. You love to build stuff with them. How many of you have ever stepped on a Lego? Right. Yeah, I just heard you grimace, right? So you know what that's like. You know how Legos work, right? You got those little circles on the top and they're the connectors. Imagine you're like this two by three Lego block. Uh, What this means is that as best we can tell, you have the capacity as an individual for five, maybe six close relationships, 
like dear friends, companions that you can be vulnerable with, share life with, go maybe on vacation with, maybe five or six. And you're maybe thinking right now of some of those closest friends that you have. In 1985, they did a study of U.S. uh, Americans, and they discovered that on average in 1985, uh, the average adult had three of those blocks filled, right? Three close companions that they could be intimate with, share life with, uh, be vulnerable with. Fast forward to 2004, almost 20 years ago, uh, same survey conducted, came back, now it was down to two. And more recently, in the last couple decades, even though we're more connected than ever before, even though we can communicate with people all across the world, it's an awesome tool, people are finding they're increasingly alone, even though they're surrounded by people and have opportunities to interact with them. What we're discovering is proximity does not necessarily lead to community. And the, able, and the ability to communicate does not necessarily facilitate an actual relationship. And so most recently, a study out of young adults called millennials, those who are born in a certain generation, one out of five would say they have zero close friends. So this is what Scientific Americans, uh, or Scientific Americans says. Deep friendships then are becoming rare, especially among the young. Now, the article promises to give you something you can do about it, and I wanted to share this with you. These are the summary points that they said. Here's what you can do if you're struggling with this. Um, Keep an open mind. Be the friend you'd like to have. Make yourself vulnerable and be the first to show trust, and be compassionate with yourself. Give yourself a break if it's hard. That's what they're saying. Now, all of this is good advice. I don't have a problem with any of this, although I'm noticing one thing that it's lacking. All of what this says, you can boil down to try harder. And the problem is, for some of you, you are trying and you're still alone. Or maybe you realize that even though you do try, you keep messing up and you keep going backwards. And so what it reveals is that more than self-help, we need another kind of help in order to experience true and lasting community. So for that, I'd like to turn your attention to a few passages of Scripture, starting with this one, Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6a. Can you read this out loud with me? Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. I love that psalm, because what it says is God doesn't care about your age, He doesn't show priority for young or old. He cares about every human being and desires that you would never walk through life alone. He's watching out for you and will take good care of you. Um, Here's another passage. This is Deuteronomy chapter 10. It'll be two slides, two verses. Verse 17 starts out this way. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. This is kind of standard language in the Bible, if you're not familiar with it, just describing how amazing God is and how awesome and powerful. But notice how he puts it to use. He executes justice for the fatherless, the orphan, and the widow, and loves the sojourner, someone who has no home or place to rest, someone who is um, lost in the world, giving him food and clothing. So the amazing awesomeness of God isn't to serve himself, but is specifically directed at those who would otherwise be looked over or lost in this world. God cares about each and every one of you. So with that then, we could turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Timmy did a good job reading it. I'm not going to go through the whole passage. It was a longer one. I'm going to look at the beginning and the end. But in the middle, you may remember what he talked about. He's, that Paul's saying that we're kind of like a human body. And you guys know you have eyes and ears and noses and fingers and toeses. And we're, we're toeses? <laughs> Not always in control. Okay. But you get the point, right? Uh, we're made up of all these distinct and different things, all of them essential for a fully functioning body. The same is true in Christian community. Every one of you is an absolutely indispensable and irreplaceable part of what God wants to do on this planet. And here's why. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Now I love, we just got a chance to see that 
today with Nora, right? We were brought into this community that Christ calls his church, and, and we didn't earn our way into it. We didn't fight our way into it. We didn't just like win the lottery and happen to end up as part of it. No, God put his name on you. He put his claim on you. He said, you, if you believe in my word of promise, if you have received this gift of baptism, you are part of my family now. You are part of what I want to do to redeem and restore this broken world. And so how does that happen? At the end of the section, verses 24 and through 26, but God has so composed the body that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. One member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now what I find really fascinating about this is from the time Paul wrote this all the way to this day, one thing in particular has stood out in the world about what we call the Christian church or Christian community. And that is this relentless ability to pursue deep relationship with one another, even if it was difficult and hard to do. And a deep desire to meet the needs of others, even those who are not yet part of that Christian community. So going back to the early centuries of the church, what they were known for is they would go to the streets and the gutters where people would be left out sick and ill and suffering and even on the verge of death, and they would take good care of them. Right? If you go around Chicagoland area right now, how many hospitals actually have some sort of good shepherd or Lutheran general or advocate even in their names? They all have roots in Christian community. The same is true about universities and schools and retirement communities. Many of them, not all, but many of them have roots in the Christian community seeking to ensure that no one was left all alone. But needs were met, and whenever one person suffered, the community would rally around that. Now, I've been here at St. Peter now almost 15 some years, going on 16, and one thing I've observed is that is true about this community as well. Whether you've been here that whole time or you are newer or here for the first time, what I can say is, is when life is at its worst, this community rallies and is often at its best. And here's how it looks. When you get that health scare, right, or you lose a loved one, the phones are ringing, the texts are zinging, there are cards, there are visits, there is this palpable spirit of love and care that is beautiful. Um, When someone is struggling in school, when someone has lost a job or their home, this community never fails to step up and often entirely on their own. They don't need anyone to tell them what they do. They just find the need, they meet it. If someone suffers, they suffer together. But what also is true is we love to celebrate. You're going to see that a little bit later on in our God sightings. That's why we do that every service, every weekend, chapel too. We love to celebrate with you when life is going well because we're to be together in both the the lows and the highs of life. Now, why is God wanting to do this? To answer that, I want to close with some words of Jesus. It's going to be several slides. It's this prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 right before his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. And I want you to see this almost as Jesus' dream for what he wants to do in and through you. So take a look at this. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, he's talking about the disciples who are with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about you. You heard the gospel at some point because of the testimony of those who were with Jesus that day. That they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved me even as you have loved me. I want you to pay attention especially to this phrase because he repeated it twice, so that the world may know. Why God wants you to live so differently because of this thing called Christian community that the world that is often trapped in isolation, loneliness, and empty forms of community would say, there's something different about these people called Christians. They care for each other imperfectly, right? We're never going to get it perfectly right. Imperfectly, they care for each other, and they're there for each other. Jesus goes on to say, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me from before the foundation of the world. Notice how love is a thread Jesus weaves throughout, right? Here's where he goes with it. Oh, Father, 
Righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. And then verse 26. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. See, here's the difference. From all the self-help advice we could get, which is good and it has its place, the difference that is made that leads to true transformation and deep relationship is receiving and then sharing the love that God has for you. The love that motivated him to move heaven and earth to walk on this planet and then to suffer and die and rise from the dead so that we might be set free from all the brokenness within it. The love with which you have loved me, Jesus said, of his Father, he wants it to be yours and then to flow through you to everyone you meet. Friends, that's what we mean when we say that Jesus refuses to leave his people alone. His deep desire is that you would experience his love, the love that he shares with the Father and with all who are part of his church here on earth, and then to spread that like crazy to everyone you meet. Amen.